Ladies and gentlemen, you are very, very welcome to our session. And uh, from my point of view, I think that this session is one of the very, very important within the forum which is going on because we are going to discuss the role of parliamentarians, the role of politicians in building cultural bridges between civilizations. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an excellent opportunity to discuss this very important matter with very special guests from different parts of the world personalities and persons who have great experience. And I think that especially now, when uh, the world is shrinking, but the problems are growing, we have to have very special approach to the problems which the current world has. Intolerance. Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, trafficking of human beings, and other very unacceptable problematic issues, unfortunately today became a reality of the current world. How can we deal with that? What we should do as a politicians? In which way we should go? All these questions we should address. And not from the local, short-term view, but globally, in order to find the solution. And from this point of view, I think, again, returning back to our very honorable guests, I think we will be able to cover to some of these issues. And of course, after presentations, we will be able to answer to some of your questions. Let me first of all introduce our colleagues and friends. I'm working as the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of our parliament, and I will try to do my best in order to moderate this panel. Together with us today, His Excellency, Chairman of the National Assembly of Djibouti, Mohammed Ali Hamoud. You are very welcome to Azerbaijan. And I think that it's really very golden opportunity to listen to you. I'm really honored to introduce first Vice Chairman of the National Assembly of the Milli Majlis of Parliament of Azerbaijan, Professor Ziafat Askarov. You are very welcome to our panel. Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of Pakistan, Murtuza Jawad Abbasi. You are very welcome, sir. We have very special guest, and I'm honored to introduce Baroness Mansour from United Kingdom, from Great Britain. We are honored to see you here. Thank you for coming and being with us. First, Vice Chairman of the Chamber of the Deputies of the Czech Republic, Mr. Radek Von Bracek. You are very welcome to Azerbaijan, and I think that's really a great opportunity to know what is going on within our very friendly country. And, of course, very interesting and very special guest of this panel, Rabbi Mark Schneier. Very special guest, extraordinary, and uh, I can say that very a uh, creative person, because uh, Rabbi was, wa was one of, the, of those few people who've been not only in Arabic countries, but been very well accepted by Arabic countries. You are very welcome to our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, I think in order to keep the time and to give an opportunity to our friends and colleagues and excellencies to express their views. First of all, I want to give the floor to His Excellency, Speaker of the National Assembly of Djibouti. Djibouti is a very special country, very important country. 
despite of the fact that Djibouti is not so big, but very influential. Djibouti has approximately one million population, but very multicultural. Djibouti today has very good relationship with Azerbaijan, and just for information, I want to say that within our parliament, just a couple of weeks ago, the friendship group with Djibouti has been established, and the leader of the uh, friendship group is here also. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Mesdames et Messieurs, mes chers collègues, les honorables parlementaires, tout d'abord, merci donc aux organisateurs de ce forum mondial de m'avoir invité et offert l'occasion de dire quelques mots à cette tribune sur le thème du dit forum. J'apporte à l'aéropage des personnalités ici réunies les salutations des représentants des peuples de la République de Djibouti. Une nation de la rive sud de la mer Rouge dont les habitants sont ici de nombreux brassages culturels. Un pays qui constitue un trait d'union entre le monde arabo-musulman et l'Afrique. Havre de paix et de stabilité dans une région malheureusement tourmentée et par conséquent terre d'accueil et de rencontre avec tout ce que cela implique comme métissage interculturel, influence et emprunt réciproque en somme comme dialogue interculturel au quotidien. Aussi, le thème de la présente conférence à laquelle vous nous aviez convié, le rôle des parlementaires dans le dialogue interculturel est pour moi d'une grande importance en ce sens qu'il permet de mettre en exergue le rôle que peuvent jouer les représentants des peuples que nous sommes dans la promotion du dialogue interculturel et au plan national, régional et international et par conséquent à la création d'un environnement pacifié à tous les niveaux. Mesdames et Messieurs, L'hémicycle est en soi un lieu où s'affiche la diversité d'une nation et par conséquent un lieu par excellence du dialogue interculturel. En tant que législateur, les parlementaires ont un rôle très important pour initier et voter des mesures efficaces pour préserver et promouvoir la diversité culturelle et pour encourager l'épanouissement de toutes les cultures du pays et ce faisant le dialogue interculturel. Ils doivent aussi influencer le gouvernement à respecter et promouvoir dans ses actions et à travers ses institutions le dit dialogue interculturel. À cet effet, il est donc important que les parlementaires assument pleinement leurs responsabilités. C'est notre souci au quotidien dans l'exercice de notre mandat. Dans la vie de tous les jours, en leur qualité de leader d'opinion, ils doivent multiplier les initiatives visant à renforcer le dialogue interculturel jusqu'à la base et d'identifier des espaces de communication et de partage des bonnes pratiques propices à se vivre ensemble. Les parlementaires peuvent aussi assumer le rôle de plaidoyer pour un dialogue interculturel dans les forums régionaux et internationaux de par leur participation aux réunions des unions interparlementaires régionales, continentales et mondiales. Pour conclure, les représentants des peuples que nous sommes, par-delà notre diversité d'origine et de culture, nous devons prendre avec tous les sérieux le rôle qui est le nôtre dans la promotion du dialogue interculturel et pour ce faire, nous abréver de plusieurs éléments de notre sagesse ancestrale, l'aigle culturel qui nous, qui nous enseigne le respect des différences et la tolérance vis-à-vis -vis des autres, comme à toutes les sociétés. Commun à toutes les sociétés, pardon. Également, nous devons nous approprier et assurer la promotion par tous les biais des gestes historiques, comme par exemple chez nous, celui 
de ce roi chrétien d'Abyssinie passer à la postérité dans la mémoire collective des musulmans des dérives de la mer Rouge en particulier et des musulmans tout court en général sous, sous le nom de Ahmed al-Najasi célèbre pour avoir accueilli au VIe siècle de l'ère moderne les adeptes de l'islam naissant, chassés de leur terre d'Arabie par l'intolérance et leurs frères et de ce fait amorcer un dialogue interculturel et interreligieux. Sur ce, je vous remercie infiniment. very much for this really fascinating and very important statement and words, really uh, intercultural dialogue, uh, very, very important, especially on the level uh, of politicians and parliamentarians, and we should do our best in order to promote, to do our best for that. And I'm really proud, for example, as a representative of Azerbaijan, that within our parliament, we have representatives, of course, of different religious and minorities. Within our parliament, we have uh, representative of the Jewish minority in Azerbaijan, Russian minority in Azerbaijan, and we are doing our best in order to be equal, which is the very important for the country where 95% approximately are Muslims. That's why from this point of view, I think with my great pleasure, I want to ask His Excellency, first dep deputy speaker of Azerbaijani parliament, Professor Ziafet Askarov. Just for information, I want to say that Professor Ziafet Askarov was the part of the working group which designed the first constitution of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And as a professor, he wrote a lot of books, articles, and he's a great lawyer. As a lawyer, as a politician, as the first deputy uh, vice chairman of the parliament, what do you think about the role of the parliamentarians, Professor? Please, the floor is yours. Temşarlar, sesi eştirakçıları, hanımlar ve cenablar. Təqribən 25 yıl bundan əvvəl siyasi fikirdə belə bir konsepsiya irəli sürülmüşdü ki, soyuq müharibə başa çatdıqdan sonra planetin siyasi xəritəsinin birinci, ikinci və üçüncü dünya ölkələrinə bölünməsi artıq öz mənasını itirmişdir. Müasir dünyada siyasi, ideoloji və hərbi ayırma xətlərinin yerini mədəni ayırma xətləri tutmuşdur. Bundan sonra global siyasətlə bağlı ən böyük münaqişələr müxtəlif sivilizasiyalara mənsub olan millətlər və qruplar arasında cəriyan edəcəkdir. Sivilizasiyaların tokuşması, İslam dünyası ilə qərb dünyasının qarşı durması dünya siyasətinin üstün aminlə çevriləcəkdir. Lakin tarixi prosesin gedişi göstərdi ki, müasir cəmiyyətin həyatı üçün sivilizasiyaların tokuşması deyil, bir-birinə qaynayıb qarışması daha xarakterikdir. Digər tərəfdən, bu gün qarşıya çıxan çox sayılı problemlər və şəriətin bütün qüvvələrini və səylərini birləşdirməyin alternativi olmadığını nümayiş etdirir. Dünya birliyi, iqtisadi maliyyə böhranı, beynəlxalq terorizm, təcavüzkər separatizm, mütəşəkkil cinayətkarlıq, narkotik vasitələrin qanunsuz dövriyyəsi kimi problemləri, yoxsulluq, iqlim dəyişikliyi, təbii fəlakətlər, epidemiyalar kimi təhlükələri aradan qaldırmağın səmərəli yollarını tapmaq zərurəti ilə üzə qalmışdır. Müxtəlif sivilizasiyalara mənsub cəmiyyətlər, xalqlar və dövlətlər arasında uzlaşmanın və əməkdaşlığın vacibliyi tarix boyu heç zaman bu qədər dərindən hiss olunmamışdır. Subut etməyə ehtiyac yoxdur ki, qloballaşma bir tərəfdə millətlər və xalqlar arasında daha sıx və intensiv təmasların qurulmasına şərait yaradır, digər tərəfdən isə mövcud olan fərqlərin daha qabarıq şəkildə üzə çıxmasına və təəssüf üçün müəyyən gərcinlik hallarının yaranmasına meydan açır. Belə görünür ki, dövlətlər arasında yaranan ixtilafların nizama salınmasının ən səmərəli vasitələrindən biri, mədəniyyətlər arası diyalog aparılması yaxud bizim sesiyamızın mövzusuna uyğun olaraq, mədəni körpülərin qurulması vasitəsi ilə sivilizasiyaların bir-birinə daha da yaxınlaşmasıdır. Bununla əlaqədər olaraq mən parlament diplomatiyasının əhəmiyyətini qeyd etmək istərdim. Parlament diplomatiyası parlamentlər arası əməkdaşlığın keyfiyyətcə yeni bir sahəsidir. O, dövlətlərin qarışlaşdıqları problemlərin həllinə, sivilizasiyalar arası diyalog üçün manilərin aradan qaldırılmasına samballı tövbə verir. Beynəlxalq siyasətlə məşğul olan bir sıra məsələlər, bağlı olan bir sıra məsələlərdə parlament diplomatiyası ənənəvi diplomatiya üsullarını uğurla tamamlayır. 
Azərbaycan dövlətinin xarici siyasətinin parlament ölçüsünü təmin etmək, dünya ölkələri universal və regional beynəlxalq təşkilatlarla münasibətləri möhkəmləndirmək üçün Azərbaycan Milli Məclisi bütün imkanlardan istifadə edir. Parlamentdə 80-dən çox ölkənin qanunverici orqanı ilə əlaqədər üzrə işçi qrupları yaradılmışdır və fəaliyyət göstərir. Bu qanunverici orqanları dünyanın 5 qitəsində yerləşən ölkələri təmsil edir. Milli Məclisin deputatları bütün xarici səfərlərində görüşlərində beynəlxalq təşkilatlarla fəaliyyət gedişində digər məsələlərlə yanaşı ölkəmizin multikulturalizm və tolerantlıq modelini daha yaxşı tanıtmaq üçün mümkün olan hər şeyi edirlər. Biz həsəb edirik ki, hər bir mədəniyyət bu və ya digər xalqın ruhunun ifadəsidir. Dünya sivilizasiyasının zəncinliyi onun tərkib hissələrini təşkil edən nadir və özgün mədəniyyətin vəhdətindədir. Sivilizasiyaların və mədəniyyətlərin diyaloqı, rəngarənç ümum bəşəri dəyərlərin qorunub saxlanması insanlığın ali məqsədi olmalıdır. Azərbaycan dünyaya etnik mənsubiyyətindən və dini etiqadından asılı olmayaraq hər kəsin hüquq və azadlıqlarının müdafiəsinə təminat verən, xalqların mədəni sərbətlərinin qorunmasına və inkişafına əsaslanan demokratik cəmiyyət nümunəsi təqdim edir. Şərqlə qərbin, şimalla cənubun qovuşduğu bir məkəndə yerləşən bizim ölkəmiz İslam və Avropa sivilizasiyalarının dəyərlərini özündə birləşdirir. Mədəniyyətlər arası, dinlər arası diyaloq və multikulturalizm Azərbaycanda dövlət siyasəti səviyyəsinə qaldırılmışdır. Azərbaycan dövləti müxtəlif dinlərə eytiqad edən insanlar üçün əminəmanlıq və xeyrxahlıq mühitinin yaradılmasına nail olmuş və bu prinsipləri milli qanunvericilik vasitəsi ilə dini eytiqad azadlığı və dini tolerantlıq sərçivəsində qoruyub saxlamışdır. Bununla yanaşı təəssüflə qeyd edilməlidir ki, Azərbaycan ərazisinin 20 fazili, yəni Dağlıq Qarabağ bölgəsini və onun ətrafındakı 7 rayonu 25 ildir ki, işxal altında saxlayan Ermənistan Respublikası, Azərbaycana qarşı düşmənçilik siyasətini xristiyan-müsəlman qarşı durması kimi qələmə verərək, ənənəvi xristiyanlıq ölkələrində xristiyan həmrəyliyi duyğularını istismar etməyə çalışır. Məqsəd qonşu ölkəyə qarşı işxalçılıq və etnik təmizləmə siyasətinə haqq qazandırmaq, eyni zamanda ölkəmizdə dinlər arası və millətlər arası münasibətləri gərcinləşdirməkdir. Əlbəttə, bütün bu cəhdlər indiyə dəş olduğu kimi bundan sonra da boşa çıxacaqdır. Azərbaycanda yaşayan xalqların və millətlərin dostluğu və qardaşlığı əsrlərin sınağından çıxmışdır. Bu gün Azərbaycanda elə bir şərait yaranmışdır ki, müxtəlif sivilizasiyaların, mədəniyyətlərin nümayəndələrini bir araya getirən dünya və Avropa miqyası tədbirlərin ölkəmizdə keçirilməsi ənənə halını almışdır. Bakı nüfuzlu beynəlxalq təşkilatların toplantılarına, beynəlxalq humanitar forumlara, mədəniyyətlər arası diyalog məclislərinə, dünyanın hər yerindən idmançıların iştirak etdikləri böyük yarışlara ev sahibliyə edir. 2015-ci ildə Azərbaycan paytaxında ilk dəfə olaraq, tarixdə ilk dəfə olaraq Avropa oyunları uğurla keçirildi. Yaxın günlərdə İslam həmrəyəliyi oyunları başlanacaqdır. Azərbaycan həmişə sivilizasiyalar, mədəniyyətlər arasında diyaloqun inkişafına kömək göstərmişdir və bundan sonra da kömək göstərəcəkdir. İnanıram ki, göstərilən səylər o cümlədən bu gün iştirak etdiyimiz Ümum Dünya Mədəniyyətlər Arası Diyalog Forumu kimi tədbirlər bizi addım-addım daha təhlükəsiz dünyaya yaxınlaşdıracaqdır. Elə bir dünya ki, orada hər bir xalq və dövlət sülh və əminəmanlıq şərəitində yaşamaq və inkişaf etmək, öz mədəni sərbətlərini artırmaq yolu ilə ümum dünya mədəniyyətini zəncinləşdirmək, bəşər sivilizasiyasını daha da irəliyə aparmaq imkanına malik olacaqdır. Diqqətinizə görə təşəkkür edirəm. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. You're absolutely right. Azerbaijan is a country where East and West can meet each other. And this is our privilege. But at the same time, we know another very important country in the middle of Europe, Czech Republic, which is also in the middle between East and West, but between within the Europe. What do you think? What is going on at the heart of Europe? What are you thinking about the challenges which we have? Because we can see a lot of Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, and other dangerous tendencies. As a first vice chairman of the national parliament, you have all responsibilities. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's not, it's not easy after Mr. Vice Chairman to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to me to have the opportunity to address you 
on such an important issue like international inter intercultural dialogue. I think that the subject of this conference has been selected, selected very timely in the world which is more and more globalized on one side and which the mistrust between various cultures is growing. Much may be done by national parliaments in order to enforce mutual communication. What is actually happening among us? Why is this referred to a, as a clash of cyber civilizations? What to do about terrorism? How to deal with xenophobia, hate and intolerance? Is the conflict and fight between civilization and inevitable destiny of our beautiful planet? I don't think so. I hold the opinion that we can avoid such pessimistic scenarios and when we can, then when we must avoid it. The, coup, the two key words which may show the way and means to a solution are law and democracy. Law is a universal language. It's a definition of minimum necessary conditions we must meet in order to be able to live in any society. Democracy reflects the will of citizens and gives their representatives legitimacy to take action. Respect for law was what held the Roman Empire together. This multinational empire was the first really globalized society. Its inhabitants were free to worship different gods. They had various culture habits. They came from different civilizations. What made this varied multicultural crowd the Romans? And what kept the empire together? It was the Roman law. In ancient Roma, you were free to acknowledge many gods, but only one law. We are also trying to govern the relations among, among nations and states through international law. This is codified by governments. However, legislative bodies have their inalienable place in its ratification, completion, and application. The second fundamental principle is democracy. As Winston Churchill said, the democracy is the worst possible system, except, except for all the others the mankind has tested. It applies that what has been accepted by the democratic majority is binding for all. If we are able to communicate between each other, then the necessary condition for each of us is to democratically approve rules, interstate agreements, and other arrangements. The ratifications process means a confirmation that what governments and heads of states accepted has been endorsed inside the states. The role of parliaments in implementation of international treaties into national law and in ratification of intergovernmental agreements is obvious. And quite obviously, it gives the legislative authorities the right and also duty to co-create the bridge over civilizations. Intercultural and inter-civilizational dialogue has been naturally conducted at many levels. It's participated by individual citizens, associations and organizations, businessmen, media, Unfortunately, the dialogue is not always informed and rational. Parliaments may contribute to suppressing chaos and strengthening the voice of common sense. Parliamentary missions are both exclusive and representative. Our representatives are sufficiently informed and granted with mandate for negotiations. Should any agreement apply to all citizens, it's necessary to test it's primary during a dialogue of legislators. And there is also a significant forum for less formal discussions within these negotiations, which serve to encourage a better understanding and clarification of possible problems and non-conformities. When governments are negotiating, cultural cooperation is also usually mentioned. Meetings at the parliamentary level have nevertheless usually a wider dimension Parliamentary delegations set out on journeys to visit their partners more frequently. There exist parliamentary groups of friends of the respect, respective uh, country, even, even in our chamber of deputies, where, for instance, an inter-parliamentary group for Azerbaijan works. And 
Mutual meetings of deputies are not limited only to enforcing the program of the respective government. There is a space here for paying attention to more issues and the representatives of the whole political spectrum are involved. What we deputies have to concentrate on is an effort to find as much context points between various cultures as possible. To find what joins us instead of what separates us from each other. But also, and maybe primarily, let us search for issues where we complement each other, where we may learn from each other. Our objective should not absolutely be an effort to create a sort of universal culture or superior culture. We must learn to live alongside one another with respect to each other, particularities without attempts to reshape the others to one's own image. One level, I would say, flat multiculturalism does not function as well as culture colonialism. The effort to either mix different civilization within one country or on the contrary to export or our own, own, well, own values abroad cause many misunderstandings and evil. The fear of globalization is nothing other than a concern about loss of own identity, a concern about a duration of one's own culture, about casting doubts on its value and life certainty. This fear is an ally of terrorists and extremists. Let's not give them a chance Let's lay down such rules for globalization that will serve to people so that they may draw from its benefits, from free market and traveling, from new prospects and opportunities. Globalization must not create winners and losers. It must not lead to replacing domestic culture with global megaculture. It must not give rise to existential or even existence security distress. Globalization must serve people, not deprive them of their work and national tradition. I think that parliaments play an important role in this process of a reasonable regulation of globalization. Members of parliament have a great chance to meet representatives of other cultures, speak with them and transfer their experience into negotiations on international treaties and international law. The key role is played here by fundamental human rights. I mean really fundamental civil liberties. They must be really universal. There is no place here for national specification specificities. People are born free and equal in their rights. This applies to each continent and to each culture. However, just in order that we may agree on a universal standard of civil liberties and enforce it efficiently. We must not extend this standard excessively. Social, cultural, or economic rights will never be regarded equally everywhere in the world. Today in Europe, we have already human rights, not only of the second, but even of the third generation, while it's rather a political construct than factual civil liberties. I'm in favor of a fair dialogue. I'm in favor of enforcing international law and a universal package of civil liberties in international relations. But I'm against imposing our own culture and our own political pro procedure on others. The consequences are in fact deterrent. Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude my speech in optimistic mood, I'm strongly convinced that it's always possible to come to an agreement. It's always possible to build bridges, not to burn them. Barriers must be overcome. The medicine for free and hate is knowledge and understanding. Thanks to our post, we are more than the others able to influence this process of knowledge and, and understanding. And that is why we also bear more responsibility. Let's exploit our opportunities. Let's be reasonable, responsible, Let's build those bridges over civilization and culture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Really, uh, from your presentation, it's, it's really very appreciate, appreciated that we have to do our best as a parliamentarians, not only to 
uh, promote, for example, tolerance, but we should go a little bit further. We should promote respect, because tolerance means that uh, I, am, uh, uh, ha I have to be together with you, but I'm not so happy with you. But respect much more better. And when I'm uh, thinking about respect, immediately uh, to my mind can, uh, uh, coming uh, Pakistan, because Pakistan associated with the words friendship, respect, support, and we are honored that today we have among our uh, friends Deputy uh, Speaker of the National uh, Assembly, National Parliament, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Bismillah rahman rahim Honorable parliamentarians, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, representatives of the various organizations, uh, it is uh, indeed an immense pleasure to address the fourth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue, a shared mission to foster intercultural dialogue and understanding has brought us together. With the renewed belief in representative institutions and the role of parliaments, we have gathered to write a new script for advancing intercultural dialogue. We are convinced that our legacy of and shared commitment to build new cultural bridges will overweigh the forces of extremism and division. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the crossroads of history. The regional and global dynamics are in a flux. The rise of terrorism across the globe, the cultural divide between East and West, fundamentalism and negation of diversity in various societies have posed a considerable policy challenge to the member of parliaments across the world. The world is facing numerous challenges linked to the globalization, migration, religious, and intercultural conflicts, and rise of radicalism in, the, in this scenario. I am convinced that parliaments Parliament's role to promote intercultural dialogue, the application of both universal human rights and cultural rights, recognizing specific and multiple cultural identities, is highly essential to build cultural bridges between the civilizations. While connectivity and interaction between various cultures and civilization is the unprecedented tolerance, dialogue, and acceptance in highly critical to peaceful coexistence. This compels me to quote former UN Secretary General Mr. Kofi Annan, who said, tolerance, intercultural dialogue, and respect for diversity are more essential than ever in a world where people are becoming more and more interconnected. Excellency, building, building the bridges between the civilization is an important tool for inclusive democratic participation and empowerment of citizens, particularly in relation to common goods and public spaces. Building bridges, bridges of understanding between civilization is a shared responsibility of society as a whole, but the onus is on parliaments as representative institutions to lead the intercultural dialogue. Fostering partnerships between the parliamentarians serve a bedrock of building bridges between the cultures and civilization. I believe that intercultural dialogue may significantly contribute to the improvement of democracy and development of the greater and deeper inclusivity and sense of belonging. We, the parliamentarians, as representative of the people, are ideally position to build the considerable cultural bridges between people and civilizations. Parliaments are not only custodian of the people's aspirations, but also cultural ambassadors of the states. The, representat the representative nature of the parliament and its inherent capacity to engage in robust parliamentary diplomacy reveals that Dialogue between the parliament is highly instrumental to generate shared understanding of each other 
each other's culture and social values. We, the parliamentarians, have a duty to build bridges of understanding and acceptance between societies, regardless of one's own identity and affiliation with the particular community. We must not allow cultural differences to separate us from each other. Our ideas, our ideals teach us that cultural diversity brings a collective strength that can benefit all of humanity. Intercultural dialogue is the best guarantee of a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world. We, the parliamentarians, are responsible to promote intercultural dialogue to encourage positive and cooperative interactions, promote understanding and respect between the cultures, increase diversity and respect of democracy, liberty, human rights, and well as tolerance for universal and cultural specific values. Distinguished guests, in the noble mission of building cultural bridges of understanding, the parliaments also look towards a robust civil society and religious scholars to complement its efforts in building partnerships to promote intercultural understandings. <coughs> the Parliament of Pakistan is determined to play a leading role in the building alliances for peaceful coexistence. The Women Parliamentary Caucus at Parliament of Pakistan is coordinating with the women parliamentarians across the world to generate shared understanding on issues common to women across the globe. The National Assembly of Pakistan has added a new impetus to parliament friendship groups and their engagements in building cultural bridges within the region and beyond. Parliamentary friendship groups have reinvigorated parliamentary exchanges for trading intercultural ideas, promoting cooperation, and improving avenues of for dialogue. Excellency, we believe in the continuous need for the joint efforts by all the major civilizations to promote a cultural dialogue which accepts diversity, plurality, and promotes freedom of expression for others at the grassroots level. Only intercultural dialogue can save humans from the harms of civilizational clashes, failing which violent conflicts will continue taking religio-cultural shape based on misconceptions and misrepresentation. Parliaments, being natural representatives, have an immense responsibility to take on this challenge, challenge and ensure a safer future for the coming generation. In the end, I must quote that the only thing that will redeem mankind in, is cooperation. We as people rep representatives should pledge to build bridges of understanding with an unflinching resolve to build inclusive and pluralistic democracies. With this, I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your fascinating presentation and I think your ideas are really very valuable, especially when you are talking about that each uh, representative of the parliament uh, should do at the same time his mission as a cultural ambassador. That's very important to promote the culture and to understand other cultures. But when we are talking about the culture, we should take into account that the, the, the, the best representative of culture, of national culture, is woman. And I wanted to restore the gender balance within the speakers who are just now si sitting here and to turn my face to Her Excellency, the great woman. She's a great lawyer and she has done a lot for her constituency and within the UK. Baronessa Mansour is a vivid example what we should do in order to promote human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And from this point of view, we will be happy and honored to listen to you. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, there are many gentlemen here, but I think as women, we will do justice with me here. <laughs> um, distinguished guests, may I begin by extending my thanks to His Excellency the President and the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Azerbaijan 
and to all other organizations inviting me here to speak today in the Fourth World Forum on intercultural dialogue. And I just want to add a few special thanks because I think this is about tolerance um, and respect. And I want to give my special thanks to Mr. Jivan Shir uh, Fazia, the chairman of the Azerbaijan um, APPG, and the head of international affairs. And she sits there and she, uh, she has done a tremendous uh, uh, uh, job in looking after me so well over the last few days. The Azerbaijan hospitality is second to none. So thank you very much, because with hospitality comes respect and dignity. And this is what I feel is the, the theme of this um, forum. It's also a real honor and a real pleasure to be in Azerbaijan in 2017, the year that marks the 25th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Azerbaijan and the United Kingdom. The UK is proud to be the largest foreign investor in this great country. And I note with great and keen interest that the stunning complex which hosted this morning's opening ceremony was designed by an Iraqi-born British architect. Given the theme of this forum, I felt this an interesting observation, this, this multicultural um, uh, view. I also recognize that this year approaches the midpoint of the international decade for the reproachment of cultures, and that this forum is therefore a timely reminder to assess how far the international community has adhered to the values of intercultural dialogue. We can spend time talking about these, and we can have forums like this, but until we actually monitor what progress that you have made, we have made, then we can continue talking without any great results. Regarding the role of parliaments in building intercultural bridges, I think it is first important to highlight the fact that parliaments should provide an example of such bridges themselves. We talk often of societies being multicultural or culturally diverse in that they contain several cultures within a specific area and who may or may not interact with each other. And I believe that this must be differentiated from intercultural societies which involve free and open dialogues between groups of varying ethnic, cultural, religious, and linguistic heritage. As such, it's necessary that parliaments do not represent multicultural entities with little meaningful discussion, but rather intercultural houses which allow for productive exchanges from varying perspectives. Not we live side by side, but we live together. We exchange views, language, and values. And underpinning the principles of intercultural dialogue is a respect for fundamental human rights, as my colleagues have already said, and notably, these political freedoms of speech expression and assembly, thought conscience, and religion. As such, it's necessary that parliaments adhere themselves to these international human rights instruments to which they are signatory parties. There's no point in having human rights. We've signed up all of us, each country, and then we abuse those human rights. And as part of this adherence, parliaments should look to mainstream cultural diversity by providing spaces which enable individuals and cultural groups to communicate their opinions and perspectives regardless of their cultural background, which in turn should allow intercultural dialogues to prosper. That is what it is we are, after all, intending to do. And these spaces need to exist within a commitment to the rule of law and democratic institutions which in turn should endeavor to maximize political participation and engagement. There's no point having parliament if then you are not engaging and representing the people that you serve. Parliaments can also contribute to building intercultural bridges at the national level through pertinent institutional changes, for example, by promoting diversity quotas within political parties, by helping to establish caucuses and by providing an effective complaints procedure 
in the event of bullying and harassment or where people feel that their voices are not being heard. Such changes not only serve to create an environment conducive to intercultural dialogue, but it also builds trust in the institution and system of parliament, which can encourage further intercultural engagements. I also wish to discuss briefly the ways in which parliaments and parliamentarians can build intercultural bridges internationally, with specific reference to an example of mine. In 2015, I participated in a post-election seminar organized by the Secretariat of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, CPA, in Pakistan, following the Pakistan Senate elections, which aimed to provide capacity building and knowledge sharing services to newly elected and returning members of the Pakistani Parliament Senate. Within this two-day seminar, experienced parliamentarians and senior parliamentary officials shared good practice from various Commonwealth jurisdictions, especially relating these uh, experiences in discussion to the local cultural and political situation in Pakistan. That was very important. This understanding proved to be particularly successful because it was learning experience for those participating irrespective of their background or political affiliations. In my capacity as a representative of the Parliament of the United Kingdom, amongst other issues, I also engaged in dialogue on the issues surrounding women in Parliament and the barriers and obstacles that often prevent female participation in politics. Indeed, such barriers and obstacles are often culture in their nature with the issues discussed including the role of the national media in representing female candidates. For my male colleagues here, people may be saying, what did they discuss? For me, they may be looking at my clothes that I'm wearing. The prejudice that exists within parliament toward female members and the views of women as primary caregivers to children. Clearly, many women do not participate equally with men in political, economic, and social decision-making, and often because there is discrimination against women, including poverty. Who are the poorest in the world? It's women. Denial of access to education. So many of our young girls are not being educated. And there is violence against women, and there is sexual exploitation. Why? We make up more than 50% of the population. And if countries are truly serious about building cultural bridges between countries and between civilization, then we must start with women, enabling them their full and equal participation in society. We just cannot talk about sustainable society without thinking about their key involvement. Engagements such as the CPA post-election seminars do not only provide an opportunity for parliamentarians to learn about parliamentary practice and procedure, but they also allow the intercultural dialogues and the sharing of best practice between vastly different jurisdictions. As such, Parliament should look to build intercultural bridges through knowledge sharing and capacity building activities and platforms. And also transparency in decision making in full access to information attract a greater commitment by those involved. I anticipate that many here today would join me in agreeing with UNESCO's association that education in this context is key. Indeed, Parliament should look to the commitment to explore formal and non-formal education settings as an incentive to, again, provide those spaces for dialogue. Um, and we mustn't underestimate that such endeavors, especially pertinent in light of the international development agenda, and more specifically related to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We have these goals. You know, for many years, we, we have the dialogue. We know what we must do. What we have to do now is deliver. That isn't what we're doing. 
So it's a global community is to deliver effective and accountable and inclusive institutions and society, noticeably promised in the 16 Sustainable Development Goals. It's imperative that parliaments around the world deliver an intercultural dialogue, both within their own walls, but also in their dialogues with other parliaments and in societies that they represent. Indeed, the shared part principles and commitments contained within the SDGs should be seen by parliaments as an opportunity to build further intercultural bridges for dialogue, as shared solutions can be identified and shared between legislators and amongst communities. So I just, and also of course we mustn't forget, and some of my colleagues touched upon the security agenda, and what th the role that parliaments can play in terms of this. And I just want to conclude by saying that as a former United Nations Security General, uh, Ban Ki-moon stated, dialogues can diffuse tensions and keep situations from escalating. We must continue to speak to each other. So accordingly, Parliament should seek to extend the safe spaces for dialogue to all parties who exist in real or potential conflict as a priority. I just want to say thank you very much um, uh, for listening to me, and I wish this excellent forum every success. And I leave by making one concluding comment, and that is to once again congratulate the Azerbaijani uh, president uh, this morning for his excellent speech. I thought it, it, it said everything that we needed to say and hear throughout the day, and also for the government for their work in A, developing this forum, but more importantly, to the people that I've seen, that I, that I have grown to love personally for their honesty and their integrity. It is those kind of values that really need to underpin as we go forward. Thank you. Baroness Mansour, thank you very much for your kind words about uh, my country and uh, this is really very important to take into account all ideas which you just uh, presented to the audience. And uh, I, uh, with my great pleasure, I want to say that uh, the role of the woman in Azerbaijan is really very, very important. Uh, approximately 20, 22 percent of uh, representatives of the parliament are women. Approximately 40 percent of those who are working within mun municipalities are women. Uh, chancellors of the university. Even we have uh, ombudswoman, not ombudsmen, in this country. And of course, the role of the first uh, uh, vice president of Azerbaijan uh, is really enormous. And that's why, of course, Azerbaijan could be and should be an example in which way we should go. From this point of view, as a members of the parliament, we already express our views, but we are coming to Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi Schneer is a person who knows much more about the uh, activities of parliamentarians in the United States of America and all uh, other parts of the world. And please, what do you think about uh, these ideas which we just uh, discussed and presented to audience? The floor is yours, please. <coughs> Unlike my colleagues, I don't speak from notes. So let me see how I can do this. So I have to look at you. Not at my paper. When the Nazis came to power in Germany, the leading Protestant clergyman of Berlin, Pastor Martin Niemöller, said the following, and listen carefully. He said, when the Nazis came to power, first they came after the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. And then they came after the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. 
And then they came after the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came after me and there was no one left to speak out. And Nia Muller concludes this immortal statement with the following words that an injustice against anyone anywhere must be the concern of everyone everywhere. I have paraphrased his comment by saying to many audiences across the world that a people who fight for their own rights are only as honorable as when they fight for the rights of all people. And this is a value, a tradition of American society, particularly within the United States Congress. Let me tell you about the United States Congress today. In the Congress, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives, and there are 100 United States Senators. So the total Congress is 535 people. Let's focus on the House of Representatives. Every two years, we have an election for Congress. This year, 55 new members of Congress assumed office in January. Of the 55, 25 represent minorities in the United States. So that 45% of the new Congress is minority. When I mean minority, African-American, Latino, Jewish, Asian-American, Muslim, Hindu, 45%. The United States is changing. There are certain personalities in the United States who may not want to recognize this change including our president, but things are changing in the United States of America. And in this spirit, just for a few minutes, I want to focus on the role of the Jewish members of the United States Congress in terms of their relations with American Muslims and their relations with the Republic of Azerbaijan. These are my two examples. Let's first discuss the American Muslim situation, and I have my dear friend sitting here, Imam Muhammad Khan, who is the chief Imam of one of the largest mosques in the United States in California. I know I am speaking to a predominant Muslim audience here in Baku. In the United States today, and I say this very sadly, it is open season on Muslims. We have seen an exponential growth in Islamophobia. We have seen more and more attacks on Muslims, on mosques, on Muslim institutions. We have witnessed a growth in anti-Muslim rhetoric and diatribe. But we understand, and particularly the Jewish members of the United States Congress, and this is an example as to how a parliament 
can bridge the gap of civilizations that the Jewish members of Congress have become the greatest defenders of American Muslims because we understand that the Muslim fight is our fight. The fight of American Muslims today is the fight of the American Jewish community and particularly the fight of the Jewish members of the United States Congress. The Jewish members of the United States Congress are leading the opposition to the Muslim refugee ban because we understand that a people who fight for their own rights are only as honorable as when we fight for the rights of all people. And this, Mr. Chairman, is a wonderful example as to how an ethnic group, there are 45 Jewish members in the United States Congress, how the Jewish congressional delegation has taken on this responsibility to defend, to protect, to champion American Muslims in the United States. That's one. Number two, and with this I'll conclude, the great states, the great republic of Azerbaijan. And you know that Azerbaijan has a very deep place in my heart. I believe Azerbaijan is the greatest role model, example, and paradigm in the Muslim world of interreligious cooperation and interreligious understanding. But in the United States, it's the best kept secret. And I am a great advocate of Azerbaijan and I don't want it to remain a secret. So last year, in the United States Congress in April, I led, and you can ask, <laughs> and you can ask your ambassador, my good friend, Elin Suleimanov, that we had 50 Jewish leaders and 50 American Muslim leaders together we did a day of advocacy with the members of the Jewish congressional delegation to advocate on behalf of Azerbaijan in the United States Congress because we wanted all members of Congress to know that when you look at the Muslim world today and you want to see the example of what it means to have a society, an authentic, authentic society of interreligious coexistence, then you look at the Republic of Azerbaijan. And this is just one more example of taking a parliament, in particular the United States Congress, to create greater understanding between Americans and this civilization here in Azerbaijan. So I want to conclude, I want to conclude with this prayer that all of us need to see one another, Muslim, Jew, Christian, we should see each other as human beings who has this who have the same needs, the same hungers, the same feelings, and the same fears just as we do, who are children of God. We are all children of God, and we are all entitled to be treated with the dignity, the justice, and the compassion that we claim for ourselves. In this spirit, I am very proud of this value system in the United States of America. And I'm particularly proud of you, Mr. Chairman, of President Aliyev, and your wonderful country for being such a role model, not only to the United States of America, but to the greater world at large. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Rabbi Schneer. That's really a very fascinating presentation. Thank you for your ideas. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm working 17 years at the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and this assembly uh, is in uh, Strasbourg. And there is a very beautiful synagogue in Strasbourg. But unfortunately, the door of this synagogue is always closed. It's not because the synagogue doesn't work, but because of security reason. Here in Azerbaijan, there is a synagogue, but the door always is open, which is great achievement of our government and of our nation. At the same time, we are proud, as my president said today early in the morning, that the one of the Asian mosques we have here in Azerbaijan and the number of mosques are growing because this is our tradition. In the center of the city, we have Catholic church. You can ask me how many Catholics we have in Azerbaijan. Not so many, but this is respect. This is our attitudes. And always, when our spiritual leader is going to abroad, he went together with spiritual leader, leader of uh, Orthodox Christians, Catholic Christians, and Jewish minority representative, which is really very important. Ladies and gentlemen, we're running out of time, exactly uh, in time, and I want to express my gratitude to these great panelists and to the great idea which they uh, just presented to the audience. I think we have to take into account all ideas and we have to take into account that there is a place in the world which called Baku, Azerbaijan, where different religious and different ideas meet each other and create something new, something acceptable for the rest of the world. Thank you very much for being with us. If uh, there is a question or something like that, maybe, no, thank you.